I'm Jason Harmon, and this is API Intersection, where you'll get insights from experienced API practitioners to learn best practices on things like API design, governance, identity auth, versioning, and more. Welcome back to API Intersection Podcast. Uh, we're here again with my co-host, uh, Anna, um, and a very interesting guest today. I, I personally am also a, a big fan of, one, failure stories are great. Uh, that's how, like, you know, I always say I don't know what to do, but I know what not to do. Um, but I also, and we've done this a few times, uh, I'm excited about today, is like, we're just getting started. Right. It's the only question I ever ask everyone. What would you do when you're getting started? So let's see what that looks like in reality with our guest today, Travis Goslin uh, from SPS Commerce. So I guess, Travis, tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, what is SPS Commerce? Fantastic. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I'm very excited to uh, to be here with you guys. Uh, API Intersection is just a, a podcast that we've used, I know, in our organization just as a uh, in our infancy of API kind of design and API first approaches. And so, uh, yeah, our organization is uh, really focused on uh, EDI, which is electronic data interchange between retailers, suppliers, um, and exchanging kind of that invoice type of data uh, back and forth along through the supply chain. And as a part of that, we have a pretty long history and, and, and legacy of API design internally at our organization, but boy, is it, um, you know, not really taking shape in the API first um, kind of perspective. Yeah, start, you opened with with EDI, I, you know, uh, and for, I know I shaved the beard off and that's probably still a shock to some people, but there's enough gray in that beard that I shaved off to uh, remember EDI and having interacted with some of that stuff. But yeah, that seems worlds away from modern API development. So it seems like quite the transition. Yeah, and we have some pretty interesting edge cases in our ecosystem of, just products that are are very far from anything rest related or anything modern and so yeah. our goals in terms of our future initiatives around interoperability of those systems and future systems really hinge on kind of our approach uh, moving forward in the future and so we're we're very much excited about how to get started kind of in this space and this industry That's Travis funny. tell us tell us about your your role right how do, you said you're getting started uh what brings you to where you are now? You've been at the company a while. Yeah, I've been at SPS Commerce for, um, you know, tangentially at least for over a, a decade now. Um, and a large aspect of that has been, uh, we've been focused on building out, you know, internal products, external products, um, but not really focusing on it from an API perspective. My individual background inside SPS Commerce has been across multiple teams. I've worked throughout the analytics teams, through across our fulfillment teams. And a part of that has always been focused on um, reducing some of the friction that those teams deal with, um, you know, in terms of APIs, in terms of just developer experience in general. And that's what's led me to my current position at SPS, which is really focusing on developer experience. And the developer experience space obviously highly intersects with APIs in, in every way, internal, external, uh, consuming and producing. And so uh, that's kind of led me to uh, participate and work a lot with uh, the leaders across SPS Commerce as we kind of pursue this new uh, API program and start to scale up our thinking on API design. Fascinating. Uh, I was going to say, that, uh, sorry, I'm going to be stuck on the CDI thing for a minute. It's like a triggering history thing for me. Uh, so did you know that the EDI spec was developed as a result of the Berlin airdrop out of World War II? I did not know that. I, yeah. I am now interested to find out more. Uh, I need to go dig up. I did a like history of APIs section section as part of like a private event once, and it was just the most fascinating deep dive. The only reason I mentioned this, by the way, is like, I think sometimes we look at modern API stuff and go like, oh, this is all a new thing we're figuring out. And it's not. Like it, it, the patterns come up over and over again. And I think some of the struggles that people have had with trying to distribute systems and connect things. Um, they're always true, right? Uh, so I'd love to understand, like, when you look at developer experience across what sounds like, you know, some historical strata here, uh, what are the things that, you know, that work regardless of, of that format? Or are you focusing more on kind of the modern stuff as, you know, saving you from the rest? Yeah, I mean, interesting question. I think it always comes back to, um, you know, our API 
first culture that we're talking about and that we're pursuing uh, really isn't a technology problem at all. It, it never is, right? It's a it's yeah. a people and, and process problem. And I think that's exactly what you're calling out is we've, you know, we've had this problem forever. Um, and so what's different now? Um, you know, what's different at SPS Commerce? What's different across uh, organizations that are out there uh, dealing with the exact same thing? And I think for us, uh, the difference is um, to some scale, the maturity of the organization um, and timeliness. So we've, you know, we've tried um, initiatives like this in the past, whether it be specifically, you know, REST API kind of focused or, or just other API um, focus in general. And uh, we, we failed a few times, um, you know, and this is, this is another, another go at it. And I do believe, um, you know, with everything that I'm pursuing that, that this is going to be different this time. And why? Uh, comes back to other initiatives in the organization comes back to the organizational adoption of it, not just, you know, this is not just, um, you know, something that Travis wants or Travis is pursuing, or I've I've convinced a certain number of departments or directors, this is an organizational uh, initiative as a whole, um, right from the top down um, that is invested in pursuing this. Um, and so in the past, we, we haven't pursued um, kind of that initiative in that way. Um, it's always been uh, thought of as, you know, pursuit of our really our end goal or products or, or very specifically things that we can draw direct monetization to. Um, and you can't necessarily do that depending on how you monetize your APIs and how you intend to use them in the exact same ways. Uh, and so this time, um, you know, we're, we're taking a run at the bat and it's, uh, you know, we know that out of the gate um, and it's no one top down. Yeah, it's interesting. Um... You know, out of that simple question, I, I usually end up asking, what would you do first? Which I think this will be the first time I don't have to ask because that's literally, you know, kind of what you're telling us, right, is is uh, what, what you are doing to get started here. Um, that 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 kind of, um, you know, uh, top level mandate, like it's it's clearly an ingredient that must be there. This can't be a passion project by somebody. Right. It's an um, investment across the organization to make it happen. I mean, one of the challenges that I think everyone is facing as well is just the predominance of APIs and not just the tech department, but in all of our departments, you find APIs everywhere and discover that, uh, you know, through the cloud, through other automation, through the simplicity of technology these days, um, everybody has an API. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to, to catch to that. It sounds like uh, by your description, if I said, you know, what's the problem that you're solving? You mentioned kind of the, the speed the pace, right? And so is the expectation that addressing what is that things aren't moving quick enough that by kind of making it easier for developers to work and innovate that you guys are moving faster? Or am I reading between the lines way too deep? <laughs> I... You might be reading between the lines. Okay. That's not where I was going with it. I think that a large focus from of my job from a developer experience perspective is reducing those day-to-day -day cycles and the developer experience to make you know better quality of life for our developers. Um, specifically, if that means there's certain aspects in you know how we do CI/CD that integrate specifically with how we're doing APIs, you know, sure. But generally speaking. I don't think anything that I've learned or anything I'm aware of suggests that as we approach this, that we should uh, expect any sort of uh, um, immediate um, increase in velocity. I actually expect the opposite. There's going to be an aspect of let's slow it down. Let's talk about our domain model. Um, let's have those discussions earlier so that we're not fumbling later down the road as we try to adapt um, to something that was unanticipated. Even your role itself, developer experience, speaks to a shift. Right. This is this has been adopted at your organization. You said there's a mandate now. It's coming top down. How long has your role been at SPS Commerce? And you know what what has been the history of that? And what do you see for the future of it? Yeah, speaking on the developer experience role, I've only been in this role probably just over uh, under eighteen months now. Um, I should say, and it uh, yeah, it's it's really a role that is defining itself. Um, as I go, I don't have a developer experience team Though we're looking at other organizations and other models that model it that way. Um, you know, my job right now is to work across those teams to make bridges and make relationships and, and understand, uh, you know, how we're going to move through the jungle. When I think of developer experience a lot, my favorite analogy is the rainforest, which is, you know, developers work in the rainforest now. They're not working in planned gardens. Um, the idea that 
I got to move from tool to tool to tool, you know, my everyday job um, and, and, you know, somehow connect those through confusion and obscurity um, is, is difficult uh, to solve. And so trying to, uh, you know, make more horizontal connections through the organization as we make some HOV lanes through the jungle, uh, so to speak, uh, maybe a poor uh, analogy for some, but, uh, you know, that's really what we're, what we're focused on. And, and APIs is a, is a big aspect of that. Um, and we're learning every day exactly what that means from a developer experience perspective. Um, you know, the, the way that I, I guess I've looked at it commonly as well is, you know, we think of math as the universal language, um, you know, for humans. And I really think of APIs as the universal language for our developers. Um, we have a pretty big polyglot ecosystem, which makes developer experience also interesting at SPS because uh, it's wildly different team to team, depending on on who you talk to and, and what they're working on. Um, but it, APIs are the same, you know, on all those teams. Well put. Um, so what is your road grader? We're, we're going to see how far we can go with this. What does your road grader look like to cut the HOV lane? Uh, <laughs> in other words, like, you know, kind of what's the... The toolbox and, and uh, you know, this may not just be tech, right? But kind of what are the, the sort of tactical things that you're doing to start addressing that and building these connections? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I don't have a great answer for you yet uh, because a, a lot of this is really, uh, you know, forming pretty ad hoc. Um, one of the things we've start to do, start to do, sorry, I should say, one of the things we've started to do is um, really look at the capabilities horizontally across the organization that we want to enable. Um, those capabilities might be um, the capability to deploy a product fresh from scratch very quickly, very simply without you know, dealing across a whole bunch of different platforms and systems to set up and, and register and create BVRs. Um, and so we're defining these capabilities uh, as items um, that we want to specifically curate. One of the problems with developer experience is, um, you know, I saw one quote um, on Twitter a while back, um, you know, defining developer experience as any event that, you know, changes a developer's um, thought or, or, you know, impacts um, what they think of your product. Um, and, you know, we're thinking of that largely internally uh, right now, but also in the future externally uh, for our APIs. And part of the problem with that is um, so that could be anything or everything. How do, you, how do you start with developer experience when it's, you know, it's every single event of their day that a developer uh, touches any, any part of the system? And so we start by defining the most important capabilities um, where we think we see the biggest gain. And so, like I said, some of those would be CI, CD. Um, and another one that we're focusing on now is, is the API first kind of mind, mindset and how does one, um, you know, design, create, roll through the API lifecycle um, to production um, through one of these um, horizontal capabilities or HOV lanes. Got it. Yeah, that uh, makes sense in terms of prioritizing things. Um, one, I want to call out here that, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks over the years and they, they mentioned developer experience. And I always have to ask, like, what do you mean by that word? Because sometimes that's what they call their developer portal development team. Right? The team sure. that builds the portal is the experience for developers, um, which um, I'm not going to, you know, butter any muffins here like I, I think that's terribly wrong and that your description is vastly better which is it's a huge thing to look at what are all the aspects in a developer's life that you know uh that we can be empathetic to which is i think what you're describing is that kind of empathy right um, and that's another thing that we hear is an you know, key attribute of success um although i want to key in on when you said capabilities um and then you really describe more kind of technology capabilities. And I'm curious if, you know, there are other views on that besides kind of API as a capability, CI, CD as a capability. Are there more kind of business oriented views of that? Uh, that's a good question. We've, from a business perspective, we've talked about, um, you know, some of those capabilities or some of those frictionless roads, um, you know, being more all encompassing. The company has some larger initiatives right now dealing with, um, what they're calling workbenches. And so we have different value streams that we've defined as individual workbenches that um, affect a different uh, personas within the organization. Um, and one of those personas is definitely the, the developer workbench and what is in that developer's workbench, what is in their tool set that is part of the well-known, you know, the beaten path um, that they need to use on a day-to-day on -day, um, kind of perspective. We're still exploring what that 
developer persona and workbench kind of looks like. Um, but we also have other workbenches that we're curating um, alongside it in terms of our implementation teams and our customer support teams and how all that comes together. I love that analogy, actually. I haven't heard that used before. Um, as somebody who constantly tries to equate the, well, and I'm trying to hide the mess of a workbench behind me with camera angles and lighting, but I'm always trying to equate like making physical things to making software and how you think about, you know, I don't want to have to reach very far to the drawer that has the thing that I use most often, right? So yeah. I think applying that same thinking of kind of shop, uh, shop discipline to like what it's like to, to run a, a tight end engineering shop. Um, that's beautiful. You can bring that back, uh, I guess, a bit to your developer portal kind of, you know, item. Um, we have other developer portals for different personas as well. Um, none of them are that great, uh, to be honest, right? Um, and the problem is, is you're in a constant, constant battle to kind of integrate the next kind of piece uh, or the next technology that's coming into it. And so we're not we're not 100% clear on what our future is for, you know, that approach of a single pane of glass, so to speak, across it all. Yeah, I forgot to ask at the beginning too, how large of an organization is SPS? Yeah, SPS is, uh, I'd probably say medium size. So we're about uh, 16, 1700 total employees okay. and about four to 500 um, technology department employees. Four to 500, yeah. There's real scale problems in those numbers for sure. <laughs> no surprise. Um, Okay, I think I get your big picture pretty good now of really looking at kind of the holistic developer experience, you know, all the things that we can do to, to make their workbench more efficient. I think zooming in on the API thing and kind of where you guys are headed down that road since, you know, it is called API intersection, uh, we have to do that. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit more about kind of where you guys are at on that journey and kind of what the vision is for it. Yeah, our... Um... Our journey has, has kind of started now down this route of, of you know, going from something strategic to more tactical components that we want to um, start actioning. Um, what can we do in parallel? Um, what can we, we start to move on? Um, and what are some of the building blocks? And so, you know, some of those things as we dive in more technically to kind of our API approach has been, um, you know, I, I kind of mentioned we, we've had some history with uh, governance and previous legacies uh, of standards that are available, um, even older portals uh, for the developer experience kind of persona that are available that are just more problematic than anything. They were never given the, the full product treatment. They were never, um, I would say, even finished necessarily. And so there's a lot more destruction there now um, than there has been help. Um, and so... Part of this is trying to um, go back um, and trying to uh, figure out how do we undo some of those things. Um, part of that has been, first of all, focusing on that culture of, of collaboration. And so thinking really, instead of saying, you know, governance, we're focusing on collaboration instead, which I understand is a fairly common approach when you start to get to the medium to large size kind of business arena. Um, you know, we don't have the ability to mandate teams to this, you know, thou must do it this way. Um, but boy, can we collaborate with you and give you a lot of really good ideas and, and help you along that we think you'll be pretty happy with. Um, and so taking that concept and starting to build a cross-functional working group, um, you know, that can focus on APIs, API standards. And of course, um, you know, diving forward into starting to think about a, an API style guide um, and what that's going to look like for the opinions expressed by SPS Commerce and where we want to go. But in parallel to that, we've also um, been dealing with a lot of APIs. So we we do have a lot of APIs, I think, for an organization our size. Um, we have about four to 500 um, that are out there today, um, most of them internal, um, you know, with a, a few external ones today that are that are available there through our documentation. But we actually don't know a lot about these APIs. And we don't know necessarily, in some cases, the owners of them. We don't know um, how old they are, you know, all the classic kind of problems that I'm sure you've you've heard on here before. And so our first goal was to think about um, a centralized API reference um, for everything that we do, some place that we can go to find this information. In our organization, um, we were fairly lucky in the sense that we kind of already have a ubiquitous design language in, in Swagger. Um, and I say specifically Swagger because we are using V2 in, in most cases, not open API. Um, but the good news is it's a pretty, pretty, you know, somewhat easy shift uh, to move to the latest version in open API. And so we do have an opportunity to start at least pooling those four to 500 APIs together to start building a more cohesive API reference. And it 
might not be something that is consistent. In fact, it's probably going to be highly inconsistent across it all. But understanding what we have is important to understand um, where we want to go, what's evolvable, what's throwaway, what's, you know, what what's the approach kind of um, for each. And so, um, you know, part of the then going back to that kind of that working group that we're putting together, recognizing this, moving ahead with open API, uh, moving ahead with rest kind of as a table stakes kind of approach to where we need to go. Um, you know, really made a lot of sense. We spent some time looking at some of the metrics, um, like the Smart Bear um, API, state of API report, you know, talking about 82% of orgs are really focusing on open API and REST. So let's let's start there. We know we're gonna have some support and some industry um, best practices that we can start with. So that's kind of proceeding along. Um, you know, we can we can dive into style guides a lot. We, we've been pushing that um, and we're kind of in a position to um, start really um, distributing that out to the organization for further approval. And so we, over the last probably four to five months, uh, we've been working through um, really building this style guide. Um, definitely not from scratch. Uh, you know, we took a lot of this stuff uh, from existing style guides that are out there. Um, I, th I believe you've had the API handyman on this podcast before and and his resources are just fantastic. Um, the style book was you know, something we started from and pulled some examples from there um, and started grooming exactly what we had an opinion on and what made sense to us based on some of that. So we, we've been looking at Microsoft style guide for APIs, uh, PayPal, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Jason. I wrote that one. <laughs> <laughs> the original <laughs> version, it's better now. <laughs> That's good to know. That one's been fantastic, um, as well as the Cisco uh, DevNet style guide has really been uh, one that has, has changed our perspective on some things and has been uh, a lot of help in, in clarifying. Um, and so, um, yeah, we've we've put that together now um, over the last uh, four to five months, and uh, we're moving it through a process that we call at SPS the SIP process, which is our SPS improvement proposals. And we're using that process as a method of um, really evangelizing and collaborating amongst the tech community with these standards, doing it out in the open, um, inner source, uh, so to speak. Um, and really trying to um, garnish as much um, you know, momentum along the way um, with that internal process uh, that we can. Wow. Um, well, I, mean, I, I love that you recognize the past failures and that you have to deal with it. I think in a lot of places, it's, it's really easy to just create a new layer of archeology span and ignore the past. Uh, so it's a tougher road, uh, but um, I will say, man, uh, you ticked off like a wonderful list of things that we hear work and that I, I know from my experience work. It's like inner source and APIs just go together. If you're not sharing code internally, you can't succeed because you have to share these API capabilities, right? Like uh, wonderful examples. Um, so when you're talking about style guides and, I, you know, we certainly are fascinated by this concept uh, the last year or so. And especially the last few months, uh, Spectral, our open source uh, project, it's everywhere all of a sudden. You know, uh, I just got keyed into uh, the UK government is actually working on defining uh, Spectral style guides for everything. Uh, the Italian government did it last summer. Like, uh, so we're really uh, hearing all these fascinating stories. But what I wanted to pick out too is that when you describe style guide, I think you're talking about something bigger but I am curious, like what role kind of automation around the style guide plays too? Yeah, when we think about the style guide, we're specifically expressing some of the common aspects of it that I think you're referring to, which is, you know, how, what does my response request look like? How do we think about, you know, verbs and um, payloads and error schemas? Um, and I think for the most part, that that's exactly what it is. Um, but we've also kind of have an abstraction layer above that, which is um, how we're thinking about it in the total process of how it evolves. So one of the things that we've often been concerned with is, well, how does the style guide get versioned in and of itself? You know, regardless of API versioning and, and suggestions it may have around that, how do we version the style guide? And in dealing with some of the legacy, um, you know, standards and APIs that are out there, our style guide may not have an opinion on something today, and your API is in conformance to it, um, but all of a sudden it has a new opinion, um, and that was an opinion formed specific to that API before, and now you're out of conformance or you're just different. And so understanding the expectations for engineering teams when they find themselves in that state um, has been a part of what we've been trying to document in terms of compatibility, how we move forward. 
like many style guides, we've been using the terminology, um, you know, the RFC terminology around should, must um, to help indicate very, you know, specific, implicit kind of um, meanings. And uh, that's been helpful in relating to some of our versioning of the style guide as well as we think about it in terms of, well, if I add a must statement to the style guide, that kind of implies um, almost a, a SEMVAR major version number increment to it. Um, so I've been trying to think through some of the scenarios related to that and how that's going to affect some of the legacy aspect. Um, other aspects that we find that in our style guide above the, you know, HTTP RESTful constructs would be really related to organizational rollout um, and how it's going to affect, you know, our larger change strategy, which um, it is a big question we have uh, right now. We're still exploring, you know, what is our change strategy? How are we versioning our APIs? But um, definitely some some SPS specific uh, problems that's there potentially. You, you've that's put an emphasis at all. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, you put an emphasis on collaboration throughout the entirety of this discussion and how it's not a do as I say sort of mentality, right? It's a collaborative working together to implement these style guides that are appropriate and that are adopted. What are some of the ways that you are working with devs to set those expectations that you, you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, let me to, just to make sure I understand that question. How are we approaching, you know, ensuring that in each individual engineering team is understanding and and uh, working with these standards? Is that if you said how do you if you said must, how do you make sure it did? <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so you, using the RFC language, gotcha. You said must. Uh, you know, what's the result of that? And and truthfully. You know, something we've always dealt with uh, at an architectural level, um, we have an internal architecture practice. Um, and that practice even has a higher set of technical guardrails um, that we implore our teams to use. And it uses similar terminology in terms of, you know, always do this or prefer this, giving you kind of the indication of how extreme the statement is. Um, and we've always dealt with the scenario where there are going to be exceptions. There are going to be people who are not doing the, the must uh, when that you know they must be so what what's with that um well that's i mean that's software um there's exceptions out there in those cases um we usually try to document those we pay attention to them and we also you know take to look to see have we done something wrong in the standards are the standards right is this is you know should this be a must um but in some cases it's just a, a simple exception um and that's okay um we just want to bubble that up to talk about it but but i guess in terms of Governing the outcome of this style guide or standards or whatever you want to call it in your organization, like, uh, do you have review processes? Is there one central group that's that's checking for that? Uh, are there automated bits that are doing some of that for you? Like, kind of what's the plumbing and and people look behind that? Yeah. So our, you know, this is very much in its infancy. I'd probably say this. We're in the you know in the theory stage. We haven't you know proven out the the process that we want to handle it. Um, Kind of more from the design API review perspective, um, you know, we do have some thoughts on, on how we want to approach it. We do have some initial investigations, some POCs, some you know betas of some reviews, um, but we're still figuring that out. Um, in a lot of cases, um, we're really you know pursuing more of a holistic approach um, linked to the kind of more global interoperability initiative that's going on. So, if you're producing an API. There are many other things in the organization that you have to do right now. And so we're trying to hook into those processes, um, you know, not from the like you have to talk to us and then you get it approved kind of mentality. Of course, that's not going to work, but we're trying to hook into those uh, scenarios in order to um, talk with teams as they work through it. Really think about the domain model. And um, in a lot of cases, we find teams building, you know, into domains that they shouldn't even be responsible for. or shouldn't even be touching. Um, and so it's a whole nother different conversation. Um, but kind of this design review process of the API and, and collaboration with the teams is, is much of a conversation today more than anything. Um, and we are attempting to, uh, you know, as you say, Jason, you, you know, you're talking about spectral. Um, spectral is definitely in our, in our um, um, kind of where we want to head in our direction. We haven't codified any of the style guide yet. So right now it's very much just, uh, you know, a whole bunch of text and that has another myriad of problems related to who's going to read it and are they even going to look at it? And um, we're, we're very much aware of that. And so through the collaboration process, as we um, work with, first of all, a cross-functional group of engineers who we hope are continuing to evangelize and disseminate the information mm -hmm. um, to the design reviews that we do currently have and run for some of those APIs from the domain conversations, um, you know, and as we jump in with a holistic approach, trying to think about 
you know, is this API even the right thing to build? Should we be uh, augmenting or changing a different API? Um, all those conversations are kind of happening, not through a process of automation or, or you know, ability to enforce it today. Yeah, it's, uh, I think part of the reason I call it out is sometimes there's uh, there's pushback to these things, right? That like you're creating a gate to get in my way of shipping the thing I need to ship that I'm incentivized to do for individual developers. And um, I think you're describing more of an enablement kind of process uh, or, or mindset to um, kind of be there when they need it um, and set up things so that you know when they need that help, even if they don't know it yet. Uh, and then educating. The other, the other aspect to it as well, we found to be very, um, I guess, productive in, in helping motivate people is if you don't do it this way, um, you know, the, the API gateway is not going to let you in, as an example. Like it's literally mm. enforced there. The or ultimate hook. The, the tooling is <laughs> literally not going to, like you're going to be on your own then, right? So it's like, yeah. we can't stop you. But just as a heads up, these are the, the pieces of friction you're going to deal with now if you decide to go a different way. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, they get through enough of that and they go, OK, let's just let's circle back and let's let's rethink this. Yeah. Um, the other aspect that we, you know, from an automation perspective that we want to pursue. And so this is literally real time happening for us. I, I was literally working on code this morning related to some of these processes. But, uh, you know, we're uh, in terms of how we centralize our APIs and our discoverability. You know, our strategy there is specifically the stoplight, you know, software as a service application, the, the studio that you guys have. Um, very powerful search. We can continue, we can publish there as a part of CICD process. Um, and so we've been almost using that as a carrot to say, hey, just, you know, start publishing your API here, whether it's Swagger V2, even if it's, you know, code first generated, not even design first, whatever, just get it in there. Once we have that hook, and once we're able to start curating and centralizing programmatic access to all of these files, um, and just to be clear, we do that by an internal service ID. So we know exactly then at that point, once they've connected the dots for us, we know who you are, we know who your manager is. <laughs> Not that we're going straight to your manager to yeah. complain. Organiz organizational context helps. <laughs> but we have your Slack channel, you know, we, we have everything to start communicating with you. And so at that point, we're looking at hooking in various types of automation, starting from the very basic set of once we get these rules, or at least parts of them codified into spectral, We'll start giving you warnings in your build. You don't even have to do anything. Mm -hmm. They're just going to start showing up. Um, and as we start to move forward in that, you know, API design first process, some of those will turn into to errors, right? You literally cannot deploy. Um, yeah. And the fact that we've got you in there now and you're you're using Stoplight to view and and search through awesome documentation um, is cool. But now our real hook and the real reason we wanted you there was to actually perform these other kind of shifts in how we're going to approach uh, some of the enforcement. Awesome. Well, uh, as CTO of Stoplight, I love hearing this story. Uh, as the host of the API Intersection podcast, I do have to give the caveat that uh, you know we, uh, as you know, didn't ask Travis to make any plugs or anything here. But uh, digging into this, I think there's a couple of key bits that I hear you say that that we see a, a lot, which is the notion of kind of the, the the API catalog, right? Just having one place to list all the things. Um, it's it's remarkable how there's not really a lot of tools to do that. But what I love is the perspective that for your remit of trying to govern this, you know, unwieldy uh, kind of API platform, that that's the trigger to engage on something sort of listed there, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's a really smart insight for a lot of folks to recognize is that mm -hmm. make it available uh, and engage. Observable. With, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned like search and stuff too, that like having the central catalog is great, but if you can't find the thing you're looking for, it doesn't do you much good. So like this is, you know, discoverability is like a super loaded term, but for me, level one of discoverability is if I'm in an organization, can I find out if something exists, right? Yeah. And uh, if it's not in an API, I don't really care. So, uh, you know, then uh, I'm curious, like, what that tends to lead to also is shared leverage, right? You have multiple teams that recognize, hey, we're both kind of doing similar things. Shouldn't we be sharing on this or collaborating together on this? 
are you are you looking at kind of any incentives around that sort of thing or steering at least yeah i mean the first comment that you made me think of is it's funny when people see their open api or their swagger spec visualized too all of a sudden they go oops that that doesn't look so good or yeah. other people are going to see this now that it's you know published it's like oh i better spend some time on that so it's almost like a self motivator to like do better mm -hmm. at your own internal documentation. Looking in the mirror. <laughs> yep. um, and then kind of the, the second aspect to that is, uh, sorry, what, what was your second question? Or what was the? Um, yeah, around shared leverage. So like, you know, uh, one of the big advantages of listing all the things is finding out where you have kind of duplicated efforts or the yep. potential to sort of have shared leverage between teams. Yeah, and that's where we're kind of approaching it from a, uh, you know, a separate or I should say a parallel kind of initiative or process happening here that I didn't mention is, you know, developing really that long term roadmap of our what we call our API taxonomy. Um, you know, what are the services we want? We know, for example, that we have, you know, three services that are all related to finding, you know, items, uh, for example, or finding locations. Um, and that's been a problem at SPS for a long time. Um, and we're really excited about how this process can help uh, shape that to the way we want it, where, as an example, who legitimately should have ownership over that domain? Um, and some really good discussions there. It's not always exactly clear. Um, and so when we think about that in terms of those incentives, um, specifically, uh, we're also thinking about um, domain modeling and sharing of those models and who is the owner then of the item model that everyone uh, will make use of. And we're also, you know, longer term thinking about some automation on how we're going to uh, validate, as an example, shared models. Um, we're also um, users throughout our design process of uh, Swagger Hub as well. Um, and they offer the ability to define uh, version models that are published um, and available for that type of capability. Um, and so really trying to think how those are going to connect to each other um, in an interesting way, um, but mostly theory at this point. Sure. Something I, I've noticed uh, from this discussion, which has been really enlightening, is that when we think about API design first mentality, we see it as a transition from just seeing APIs as technology, pieces of throwaway technology, and moving it toward a more collaborative, communicative, uh, you know, people-centric approach. The way you're doing this is in practice exactly what the sort of benefits that we've seen. You, you're using words like communicate, collaborate, even motivate. Those are yeah. in, intensely human centric words, right? And yeah. so you're moving that conversation from, we have three APIs that do the same thing to let's figure out what we need to do as a team to make the thing we really need. So it, it goes back to, I think Jason's comment about now that you're in an API reference where you can see everything that's searchable, like the power of when you go, oh, so-and-so team has this, like that type of discovery or that type of, um, you know, that type of result didn't happen necessarily at all. If it did, it happened too late in the process to change it. Yeah. And so really, you know, there's such power in that, right? Like just being aware of what else is out there and what else is in development at the same time is just more more awareness than we've had in certain areas of organization in the past and that alone whether it it comes up through the api design review process or just uh you know uh, naturally as a part of them searching through uh the api reference um all of it is just a huge benefit um that you can't necessarily quantify or see as the tangible like you know value out of the api kind of design first process right so to that point and uh i think this is this will give us a good uh I don't know, I guess it's a bit of a businessy wrap, but like, how are you looking at kind of measuring the effectiveness of all this stuff? And and in terms of kind of the management folks who are, you know, signing your check and funding this kind of program, like how are they getting a sense that value is proceeding and that this is good? Or is this just simply, you know, uh, if we don't have great APIs and developer experience, we know we're at a competitive disadvantage and that's good enough. Like, how are, how was that looked at? Yeah, again, not a great answer for you because we literally were having these conversations last week as well. About Good. Even even with the onboarding of Stoplight, we're new Stoplight customers as of the beginning of this year, um, as well as Swagger Hub. And how do we even quantify the success of those internally for the value that they're providing? Um, 
And, and their answer is, uh, it's not a direct link. I mean, we have all the metrics, all the Google analytics, we have all uh, you know, the number of projects that are there. Um, but there is a difficult aspect that we're analyzing, especially with the developer experience space in general. Like, how do you measure? Um, or how do you get a metric to say that you know, this, this is helpful? Um, we can take a look at, I think, a lot of tangential areas. So <laughs> looking at you know, how many duplicate services we have now um, compared to before. Um, you know, would be one tangential thing. Yeah, uh, but to some like, extent, you don't know that until you're uh, deeper into it, right? Yep, exactly. So I'd say we don't have a lot of great answers to that today. Um, but I mean, the great aspect of it is I think the industry is in a position, like you say, that we do expect that following some of the best practices and and really pushing forward with, you know, some of the things we've been talking about here, there is a, a, a well-known outcome to it um, that yeah. we are you know, pursuing the best practices and the right things. And so we, we do expect there to be some aspect of, uh, of success out of that. To what degree, of course, we have to see and measure. Um, but I think we're in alignment that this is the right way to go, the right thing to do. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. And I think that's, for me, the bit out of those discussions early on of should we do this or shouldn't we, is what's really comforting to me. And I mean, even I think it was like Forbes lately publishing stuff from one of the co-authors of Platform Revolution and a bunch of other books that I worship. Um, basically saying like on a, I think a three-year timeline, there was a 12% greater growth in companies that had comprehensive API strategies relative to competitors that didn't. It's like we now have this substantive data that we can generally take as true. It's kind of like... You know, five, 10 years ago, if you said, hey, let's open up an API to integrate with something, you got to go through, you know, a year of justifying it to get it funded. And now it's like, well, it's at a bare minimum, if you're in, say, SaaS business, it's going to reduce churn, right? Yeah. And that's good uh, in, in SaaS business. That's good. So let's just get started and we'll figure out some of the more nuanced ways of measuring those steps in the strategy. But um, yeah, I think for, for folks who are listening who are like, how do I get started? It's to some extent just look at the competitive landscape and evaluate where you're at relative to competitors on your sophistication with APIs, you know? Uh, well, look, uh, Travis, I think uh, first, I just really want to thank you for incredible transparency. I think really this, great. It, in more like one of the main things I wanted this podcast to be from the start is a place that we can all share what we're trying, right? Uh, I think over the years, it always felt like this is stuff we're not allowed to talk about and no one got to share and we didn't get to kind of swap notes and places like conferences is where we all secretly did it over beers, you know? Uh, and now like, uh, I love, you know, and kudos to you, I think your organizational leadership that you have this freedom to come share up to the minute things that we don't know yet. Uh, that's, that's super admirable. And I know for listeners hearing that story of, you know, past failures and exploring new futures. And uh, a lot of folks are in the same place. Uh, so thank you for that. Great. Yeah, no, super happy to, um, um, to document as we go. And um, yeah, you can, you can continue to follow us on our blog at tech.spscommerce.com. Um, we'll be getting some information out there as we, as we go through some of these challenges and, you know, find some of the results to some of the questions and uh, that we talked about today. Um, we're also going to be, um, you know, going out into the community this year a bit more. So you'll find us at UberConf in Denver and ArcConf in Florida. And we're just going to be straight up and talking about our experiences. And, you know, here's things that we found that worked and here's things that we don't know if they work yet, but we're trying. So very excited for that. Well, you're going to good places to meet people who've been on that journey probably longer than you. And I hope it helps you uh, find some of those next answers. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. If you have a question you want to ask, look in the description of whichever platform you're viewing or listening on, and there should be a link there so you can go submit a question and we'll do our best to find out the right answer for you.